Daniel O'Brien here. Today I'm talking with Greg Hart from New Zealand. Thanks for your time today, Greg. G'day, Daniel. Yeah, thanks for having me. Today I wanted to talk to you about your journey. You've got um, quite a big farm there uh, in New Zealand and as I am talking to people about regenerative farming, uh, I want to get people from sort of all different areas. I've spoken to Bob Wilt in USA that uh, grows berries. I've talk to farmers in in Australia in in quite dry regions but your farm's probably a bit different I want to if you could share a little bit about your farm and a bit about your journey of regenerative agriculture for the last period of time yeah sure so Mungarara station is about 600 hectares um, and central Hawke's Bay which is the east coast of the North Island of New Zealand Um, it's a traditional sheep and beef farm and I guess it's been about a 20 year journey for us now coming from a very traditional background, you know, a degree in agriculture and, you know, real production focused on on our farming. And um, about 20 years ago, we, we had our first child. And, and again, you know, at that time, you start thinking about the future a bit more and thinking a little bit deep, more deeply about, you know, the food that you're giving your kids and, and what their future might be like. And so that sort of lent it you know, led us on this journey of of learning a whole lot more about, you know, the world around us. Um, One of the big ones for me was understanding, you know, the inputs going into our farm and agriculture, particularly pastoral agriculture, is the backbone of the New Zealand economy. And that agricultural production system is based on bringing phosphate fertilisers out of North Africa with all the fossil fuel energy involved with, um, you know, digging that up and transporting it, putting it on a ship, bringing it here, processing it, trucking it, flying it. And it just didn't seem like a sustainable system to um, base, you know, the future of, of our economy, let alone, you know, the food system that, that uh, we all need. Yeah, okay. So um, that, that was one of the big the big ones. And so it, it's really, um, I guess, been about connecting the three E's as they talk about them you know, the environment, um, energy and the economy and trying to, you know, connect the dots between between those threes and, and realising that all three of them have some pretty major headwinds um, approaching them right at this minute. And so how do we negotiate our way through um, through these coming challenges and sort of create, you know, a space where humanity can, can thrive um, and basically, that's all. It's all about um, you know reconnecting with nature and observing nature, and and you know taking her as our guide. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So, what, when you sort of made the change for regenerative agriculture, was it sort of did it happen sort of over a season, or was there sort of an event like as you said when your kids were born, like stop, I've got to drastically do something different? Because like for some people it is something's happened, they go, I've got to redo this. And in Australia, some some people I've talked to, like it was deregulation of the dairy, like hey, we've got to do something different. For some, it was a major drought. What was it for you, or was it over a bit of a season or one point? Yeah, no, it's gradual and it's ongoing. And, you know, the cool thing about it, once you sort of step into um, the space of a regenerative agriculture, you know, you realise that you're never going to learn it all. But, um, you know, your thirst for knowledge really, you know, increases because you just understand that there's a whole other world out there, you know, and particularly talking about that whole world that's underneath our feet. Um, learning, understanding that, you know, all the microbiology and... Um, you know, I, um, you know, the, the older you get, the more you realise you don't know, I guess, is, is kind of the place that we're at at the moment. So it certainly um, is over a long time and it's been through a lot of learning. And, you know, there's been a lot of, um, you know, global leaders that have, that um, workshops and things that I've been to that have really influenced my thinking. And, you know, it continues to evolve. Yeah, fantastic. So tell me a bit about your farm maybe 20 years ago before you adopted some of the principles and give us a bit of a snapshot of where it is now. Okay, so I mean it was a very traditional farm and that it was all about, you know, um, pastoral farming in New Zealand is about basically um, 
you know, you're, you're balancing your pasture growth rates with the animals that you have on, but um, you know, you're trying to eat pretty much every blade of grass and, and you're replacing, you know, what the animals are taking out with um, fertilizer to go in, into the system to keep it, keep it all operating. And so again, you know, our sort of path, we haven't you know got certified organic or anything like that yet because our focus has been around sustainability and you know the big one is really trying to get fossil fuels out of food production and understanding that you know at the moment you know most people on the planet are eating fossil fuels and the energy that's involved in producing our food and so so that has mean um, reducing the inputs we haven't taken all inputs out of the farm you know, we, we still have various sort of fertilizer um, but more local based fertilizers um, going into the system. But um, it's really transitioned from, from that more traditional farming system to you know, the holistic grazing management and trying to understand that whole system of, of um, taller pastures and making sure our animals are just um, leaving grass behind, trampling some of the pasture back onto the soil surface so it can be broken down to feed the biology and keep that whole cycle going. And so that's sort of been the, the big change as far as our animal management. And we've gone from, God, 20 years ago, I think we had 3,000 breeding ewes on the farm. I think we're down to about 100 at the moment. We, we will get them back up a bit, but you know we've gone from a predominantly sheep-based system to a cattle system where all our cattle are, um, you know, in larger mobs. We've got a mob of 260 um, sort of 18-month-old de- um, Frisian, sorry, Angus heifers at the moment out there. And um, so our, our cattle are all sort of bunched up and on daily shifts, and it's, it's so much easier for me at this stage to manage that behind a single-wire electric fence with those daily shifts um, than it is, you know, the, the sheep take quite a bit more management and, and uh, better fencing around the place so so that it has been yeah more cattle less sheep and longer grass so other than cattle and sheep you're running any other livestock at the moment yeah we've been quite influenced by joel salatin in america um been very fortunate um to host him in new zealand on three occasions including you know a visit to the farm here and you know again i just also understand that you know if we're going to make these necessary changes that the scientists are telling us we have to over the next 10 years you know of of reducing fossil fuel usage then i think that's going to mean there's going to have to be a whole lot more people go back onto the land and producing food and again the new zealand system at the moment where um like our farm at 600 hectares and you know about three and a half thousand four thousand stock units as we call it which is a a one breeding new equivalent is really about a one person farm and you know uh, that um yeah there's so much more opportunity to increase production and also create other employment opportunities for for more people and so that's why we have added um a few pigs to our system um we have a portable hen house you know like joel does his um, following around behind the cattle, um, we've we've got a lodge on the farm. So again, part of what we're doing is is trying to our whole journey is about trying to connect people back to the land, you know, and understand how their food's grown. And and so um, having a lodge is fantastic. You get to meet lots of people. I think we just started keeping account of how many people come and visit the farm, and it started that uh, halfway through last year, and we got to a thousand and fifty just over. The six-month period, so there's there's a whole lot going on with um, yeah a whole lot of interesting people and getting to share our journey as well, which is another part of of what we're doing is trying to build a, a community of supporters or a community of care holders around the farm. So um, we're not doing it by ourselves. Yeah, awesome. T- tell me about um, your tree planting. I know you've planted uh, just a few trees on your farm. T- tell me about that. And and I suppose the before and after, like what did your farm look like in terms of trees and what does it look like now? Yeah, well, our part of um, New Zealand and, and Hawke's Bay here, you know, it can be a bit of a, a treeless desert because, you know, this country that was once forested before humans arrived here and, and you know, I'd love to have a, a time travel machine where I could just 
go back a thousand years because in New Zealand, you know, being the the last you know big landmass on the planet to be um, inhabited by humans, and you know less than a thousand years ago, you know, and we've changed our environment so much, you know, over that period of time and largely deforested it, mm. and so you know now. I feel that it is time if we're going to do this that we have to restore that balance between nature and humans because you know it's never going to go back to the way it was pre-humans and because you know there's almost five million of us living in this country at the moment and so we've just got to find a space for ourselves to live alongside nature and um, New Zealand is a, is a big food producer I um, forget what the number is exactly but you know whether it's 20, 30 million people that you know we feed from New Zealand at the moment as being a, an export economy, um, but there's still a lot of potential I feel to to get more trees back on the land, and um, on my farmer's income back in I think it was around about 2008, um, didn't have a whole lot of extra money for planting trees, and so at that time um, I approached Air New Zealand with an idea of you know exchanging air points for a tree planting program. And they um, were just about to start the Air New Zealand Environment Trust and were looking for a project. So we were just really fortunate that we were the right place, right time, right story. And so we formed this um, relationship and had a budget for three years that allowed us to plant 85,000 trees on the farm, um, most of those New Zealand native trees. But we have also included um, exotic trees you know, through the pastures and um, around the farm. So. You know, that's really you know transformed our landscape, and um, you know that happened at the time of 2008, and so it sort of coincided with the financial crisis, and so we got to the end of our three-year budget, and they kind of said there's there's no more because the money wasn't flowing into the environment trust for people offsetting their flights as they had hoped, but um, you know it was a, a pretty incredible three years, and um, we've continued to go along planting trees as as best we can. You know, since that budget finished, and I think we're up to about 110,000 trees now. Um, and again, that's with a whole lot of support from the community around us and um, crowdfunding, and you know, and it's just fantastic. And I think, you know, as far as climate change solutions, you know, regenerative agriculture um, is an essential part of that, um, and part of that is including trees into our landscape. And um, I think you know, just looking at some numbers coming out of the states and and that around you know what they're able to achieve achieve through silver pasture type tree plantings or maintaining um, their animal production systems, um, you know I think New Zealand could be 200% um, carbon negative just by by implementing a silver pasture agroforestry type system you know on our 11 odd million hectares of um, pastoral land so. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting. And of course, you know, with that, you know, there's all those animal welfare benefits and a whole lot more natural not, um, nutrient cycling and all the biodiversity benefits. And so, you know, it seems like a no-brainer to me, but um, you seem to be a wee bit slow on the uptake there, but it's, a, it's yeah. a huge opportunity. So with the trees, explain to me, like these trees, they're scattered through the pasture. You haven't just like fenced off paddocks and locked the gate and planted it with trees. How have you gone about planting these trees yeah well with that early um, in New Zealand money we did plant a number of trees through paddocks and there were some learnings there because it has been quite difficult to establish those trees with livestock initially we put a sleeve around the trees they were about probably one and a half to two meters tall when we planted them we grew them you know in um, bags to that size and then put a sleeve around them and then only grazed sheep in those paddocks for the yep. first few years. Yep. But it's been a long, slow process. And although I don't like straight lines, I think um, future plantings will be more probably either on contour or north-south facing and um, just with a hot wire on each side of the, the row of trees. And um, so we can still graze cattle between the rows. And you know, there's a big opportunity in New Zealand at the moment because we are – able to claim carbon credits from our um, from trees growing trees and the definition of a Kyoto forest at the moment is as long as you have or have the ability to get to 30 percent canopy cut that you claim carbon credits so and you know with carbon prices being 25 30 dollars a ton um, at the moment you know at current prices you're able to earn about double if not treble 
um, from carbon, what you are from from your animal grazing system at the moment. So, you know, the two work really well together, and so you know, huge opportunities. Yeah, yeah, fan, fantastic. So you said with the tree planting, that's something now that you just you'll just continue on um, each year, continue planting. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, a lot of most of those trees we, we did fence off um, a twenty hectare gully that was kind of steep, eroding um, land on on a hillside on a farm, and connect that up to um, about fifteen hectares of old native forest. For for some reason, they forgot to cut that down back a couple of hundred years ago. So yeah, okay. so we've we've, we've added we've added to that um, another twenty hectares. So that's there, and there are a few. Forestry blocks. So, um, excuse the little dog. <laughs> um, around as well, but um, yeah, just just uh, there's all sorts of everything. There's a whole lot of diversity out there, and of course that's the that's the catch cry: is diversity, diversity, diversity. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and how have you found the trees? Like you said, when they were young, you had to sort of manage them with the livestock. But some of those early trees that you would have planted in 2008, 2009. Are they at a size now that you're finding they're benefiting the livestock because they are providing shade and other benefits? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. No, so, um, yeah, shade you know, is a big thing. We do get um, hot summers here, and, and so, you know, the shade's pretty important for an animal welfare thing, and, you know, there's a lot of poplar trees out there and understand that, you know, they have quite, when they're dropping their leaves, you know, in the autumn time, that has quite high zinc, content in yep. the leaves and um, facial eczema can be an animal health challenge at that time of year which you know zinc benefits that so you know it, it all works in and um, there's a native plant called flax harakiki is the Maori name for it um, again you know the animal and that's sort of planted all around the paddocks and and the animals can self-medicate by chewing on some of this and they, they love it and and getting you know the, the goodness out of it I think you know some higher tannins and and that to help you know self medicate is also really benefit beneficial yeah excellent so with so if you what what advice would you give to someone that they've been farming they might have been farming for 10 20 years and they've just been going down the traditional way of as you said they're just buying in fertilizer putting it on and just in that cycle but they want to sort of jump off that treadmill what advice would you give to them do they jump off cold turkey how do they actually implement regenerative agriculture well, I think you know, it really is exciting times because you know that wave is, um, is is taking off all around the world, and like in New Zealand here, there's um, some really cool groups you know starting to organise and and um, you know farmer based groups called um, the one in New Zealand that's really leading the charge there is called Quorum Sensing, and so you know there's a Facebook there in our local community in Hawke's Bay. We've got a um, Hawke's Bay Regenerative Agriculture group and so there's other people around that you can talk to and um, there's field days um, so you know get along to those and you know because talk to other farmers because farmers you know always um, pick things up a whole lot better when they can see it and touch it and feel it and um, rather than sitting in a lecture theatre somewhere it's it's a whole lot better if you can get out there and, and actually yeah get onto a farm. Um, you know I've been really I've, I've listened to all the ground cover podcasts out of australia and and um you know around here, really appreciate all that's going on over there although the big one is you know again um darren doherty is uh, a bit of a hero of mine and um you know the big one is and he talks about the first one and his um levels of change is is the climate of the mind and i think when you open up your mind to understanding that there is another way i think that's that's the first and that's the biggest step but you know getting along to farms talking to other farmers and like that will, will help you um make that jump and and then uh, yeah hold on for the ride because it's pretty good <laughs> it's interesting you talk about the climate of the mind because yeah i i interviewed darren doherty just just a month ago and and as he always does he, he brings that up and talking to other farmers, they do say that the mindset 
And f- for you, Greg, how did you find the mindset shift from always doing it sort of the old way, the traditional way? Was that a struggle for you of like getting your mind looking at new solutions? How was that for you? Well, I'm not sure even if, if it's the mind, if it's it's a change of heart might yep. be as much of it because I think you know this really is each individual person's um, personal journey through life. Mm. And I think you know, when we get over our egos a bit and understand that um, we don't know it all and can't control it all and kind of let go a bit and start working with nature rather than against it and trying to control and dominate things all the time, you know, I, th- I think you know that is the big shift, and and I'd like to think that um, you know what we're seeing out on our farm at the moment, which is you know a whole lot more diversity, and, but to me a whole lot more beauty, is um, as a reflection of you know my journey through life, and um, just letting go of a whole lot of stuff, and um, you know working with others and and. Um, you take, allowing others to come along on the on the journey, you know, with us, as um, you know, ma- managing the land. So I think you know, the farm is a reflection of what's going on and within us as well. Yeah. When you say, um, yeah, as you said, the the farm is a reflection of of what's going on. I just want to tie that back to livestock. The the livestock. How have you found the health and performance of the livestock now compared to before you did regenerative agriculture and, and sell grazing? Do you still need to use the same amount of medications? Are you still having the same issues? Or how has that changed? Because the livestock are actually a reflection of their environment, of what they're eating and how they're managed. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, I, th- I think, you know, there's there's a lot less inputs going into our our animals these days as far as animal health and that. Um, again, you know, with our animals grazing the taller pasture, um, they're not having the same parasite burdens. I guess, um, you know, daily shifts and making sure that, you know, they're getting the quality of feed every day. Um, and so, yeah, our, our animal health challenges really are minimal. So, I mean, we do have to watch. Um, there's still, you know, so much more we can do. And, and you know, this year I really want to um, be looking at, you know, balancing the minerals and, and, you know, offering free choice minerals to our animals. So, you know, I know we've got room for improvement there. Um, but generally, um, our animal health is pretty good. Yeah, excellent. So before you were moving them daily, what sort of system were you using to to move your animals around was it set stocking or just a couple of paddocks how were you doing it before daily moves no i was never stocking um set stocking i guess no, most new zealand farms um you know are on a rotational grazing system but it was just perhaps the the length of the pasture and um the rest period before you came back onto the to that pasture is probably the biggest change that we've done as far as our grazing management and um yeah perhaps you know and mod- mobbing up the animals and um trying to achieve that trampling effect as other big changes yeah yeah fantastic well thank you so much for your time today it's been fantastic just to get uh, a- an insight to your farm um uh, under this video and, and this recording, I'll make sure I, I've got links to your website. There's absolutely stunning photos on your website and Facebook page of your farm and the big lake. Tell me about that big lake that that we see in, in the picture. Is that a lake or a dam? What, what's that? It's huge. Yeah. Well, <laughs> not so huge, but it's um, about 35 hectares of water, which was a... Um, an old meandering stream, which you know, however millennia ago, got got cut off, and so yeah, really fortunate to have have um, that out there as a bit of a recreation and wildlife reserve. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk again. Cool. Thanks, Daniel. All the best. <laughs>